Hello everyone, I am Tomáš, lead keeper of the Invertebrate Collection of Chester Zoo. We are here in Tripa Reserve Station in Monsoon Forest uh, and we have some really interesting invertebrates that we would like to show you today. First of them will be an interesting ant species, which is called the Golden Weaver Ant. Um, the question is why it's called Weaver Ant? That's where the interesting part starts. Um, you can see them over here, we have a large colony. We have thousands of specimens in this tank and they are all living together in one big nice cozy nest. They have to build a, a nice big nest somehow and here comes the tricky part of it um, because they have to build it something. They're using uh, small particles of sand or, or plant material and things like that but they have to glue it, stick it together somehow. They have teeny tiny larvae. These larvae are producing a silk just like the silk moth caterpillars. This silk is a, a, a sticky thing which can be easily used to building, uh, some, uh, building materials from it. Um, uh, normally this silk is used to making a cocoon to protecting the pupa of the ant. Uh, but these ants uh, develop something different. They're using the tiny little larvae to holding up and squeezing out the silk from them and gluing and using the, uh, the silk as a glue to, uh, to stick together, gluing together all these tiny little particles of the step of the sand or, or like small pieces of leaves and things like that. Uh, it's a real strong and really, but meanwhile, really, really um, lightweight structure. The entire thing is uh, uh, built for, for one purpose to, to protect the entire nest. Inside there, there's lots of lots of workers working with the larvae and with the queens. Yes, this is right, not just one queen, they have multiple queens in there. Um, every single queen uh, is, made for one is produced for one purpose, to bring as many eggs as she can to grow the colony as big as possible. Uh, from these tiny little eggs, uh, what they lay in, uh, small little maggots hatching out, and those need lots of food. Um, the, the maggots uh, are feeding on only animal protein. They have to collect it somehow. This is why these ants are really, really good hunters. Uh, out in the wild, they are really uh, effective uh, in hunting down anything which is like small sized invertebrate and bring them into the nest and feed them with the larvae. Here in the zoo, we're using pre-killed prey items, crickets, cockroaches, or orchids to feeding, feeding the ants. That's what I would like to try to show you now. We have some small green caterpillars. I will just place on top of the nest. So you will see them start to devour and eat and take it to pieces and bring it in later inside of the nest and feed their tiny little larvae. Adult ants are not just good hunters, but actually they're good in finding small flowers as well. Uh, the adult ants need nectar and pollen to eat. Uh, they need a sugar solution, that, and that's uh, the best uh, to find it in small flowers. So in the wild, they, they're visiting time by time um, um, uh, flowery meadows and flowery areas of the forest uh, to feed themselves and, and drink some nectar. Um, here in the zoo, we're providing them um, honey water in small dishes down in the base of, of the tank. If the colony raise up to uh, grow to a decent size, they can do something really different than, than the normal ants do in. They can divide the nest, they can make satellite nests and forming new colonies all around the, in the area where they live in. This way they are really prolific and a really um, um, these strong species in Southeast Asia and pretty really widespread. Let's go to our next station. Let me introduce you to another different, very, very interesting animal. Let me 
introduce you, Amber, who we're picking up from here. Hello, so I'm Amber. I'm another one of the invertebrate keepers here at Chester Zoo, and I've got another really interesting species to show you today. So I don't know if you can see what I'm holding just here, but this is called a giant walking leaf or a giant leaf insect. She's just on my hand at the moment. They usually live in this enclosure just behind me here. I'm not sure if you can see, but we've got six of them in there at the moment. Now, these animals are masters of disguise. So they look just like leaves. So you might not actually be able to see them very well in the enclosure at all right now. So they're just sort of sitting on the leaves and that is their survival strategy, basically. They just sit really still in the leaves um, and they camouflage so hopefully none of their predators can see them. Hopefully you guys can see it a bit better there. Now, a thing that I really love about this species, actually one of my favourite in the zoo, is that they're all females and I find that really, really fascinating. And you might wonder, how is that possible? We're not really sure, to be honest. The scientists are a bit confused, but we basically think that they're evolving um, just to not need males anymore. So they don't need males to reproduce. So all of these are females, which I think is pretty fascinating. So I'm just going to pop this one back for now, and I'm going to show you some of the babies as well. Now, as I said before, these guys don't have any other defence mechanism, so they can't sting, they can't fly away. So their only way of keeping themselves is to stay camouflage. Um, and then what that means as well is that they have loads and loads of babies. So in this box here, hopefully you can see these. These are just loads and loads of eggs. These have all been laid in a period of about a week or so. So they'll lay hundreds of eggs and that really maximises the chance of survival of the babies out in the forest. And when these guys hatch out, we've actually got some really newly hatched ones here for you to see. They're a slightly different colour. They're really small and brown. I don't know if you can just see here, they look sort of like little tiny dead leaves when they uh, first hatch out and then every time they shed their skin um, they get a bit bigger and a bit greener until they look just like these. So I'll pop this one back for now um, and I'll head over to Thomas again. He's going to show you another really interesting species of invertebrate here in the Tripper Research Station. So follow me. Well, nice to see you again. Uh, the next species I would like to show you is called the emerald cockroach wasp. Um, it's a wasp, but unlike other wasps what we normally see in our garden, it's not living in colonies, not living in groups. They are living solitary, which means they are living on their own, um, and they have to find uh, somewhere to hide their babies. And this uh, will happen in a really fascinating way, which will be possibly a bit scary for, for some of us. Um, so these uh, wasps actually parasite. They're parasiting something which is commonly known from, from many areas. The, the actual host species is the American cockroach. I have these two toys here to show you how they do it and uh, uh, how to hunt uh, the cockroaches. Um, over here, um, actually only the females who are hunting. The males are there for only one, le one reason, only for the mating. The females are the good hunters. They looking for the roach by their smell. They can use their antenna to feel, feel, feel the smell of the cockroach. Uh, they're wandering around on the forest floor and trying to find a trap of the cockroach. If they found it, they're trying to go as close as possible and grab the roach by the neck, just like that. And they're using their abdomen to sting, here's the stinger, using their abdomen to sting the roach, the cockroach, by the neck. The reason is that part of the nervous system works for movements. So basically they're turning off the cockroach, it will be basically just a zombie. It just stands there doing nothing. And then here comes another interesting part. Uh, the wasp chewing off the end of the, uh, of the antenna of the, of the cockroach, grab it by there and lose it, use it as a lead to, to lead it, to pull it inside to a, like a small crack or a small hole and hide it there. Why? because they will lay a tiny little egg onto the roach, somewhere that is can reach it. And it's laid there, sticks on, and then the roach will be perfectly prepared for, for the next generation. It needs hiding, so the, the wasp is hiding it with small little rocks uh, or pieces of leaves and things like that. Next day, that's when the 
let me say, a bit scary part starts. From this tiny little egg, a teeny tiny maggot catches now and sticks itself to the side of the roach and starts to suck out every bloody, bloody fluids from the body of the cockroach. The hemolymph and everything else, what's, it, what's in there? After a few days, if you reach a decent size, it's a very big, large maggot there, and it chews itself inside to the cockroach and eats every, every organ entirely from, from the inside of, of, uh, of your little roach, your little cockroach. Um, and then pupates inside there, and about two, three months later, an adult big wasp hatching out from, from the cockroach. Always just one wasp in, in every single co uh, cockroach. Over here, I have a few living cockroaches, and this is the way how we're feeding them here in, in the zoo. Um, we have to provide them fresh cockroaches every day, so we just feed, let them in. Unfortunately, it must be uh, living cockroaches. Uh, they can't grow on, um, on pre-killed pre items, so we have to use these every day. Open it. Then. And let the hunt begin. Possibly maybe hiding a bit, but let me see. Oh, there you go. Um, it looks like a rodeo. So females are going to grab the roach. The entire process took about a couple of hours to finish the finish parasitizing the, uh, the, the cockroach. Um, and then next day it starts again and again and again. They are really uh, effective, really prolific, prolific breeders, and they are really good um, as a pest control against cockroaches. We have, just to show you something, uh, how it happens here in, in the zoo. Look over here, what we have here now. It's a fresh hatch of a small wasp. And I just about to release it into the enclosure. Begin together with the others. This is actually another female, and she will be another one who's hunting for the roaches. And all that's left is just an empty shell and nothing else. And now I'll lead you to something a bit more friendly and not as, uh, uh, as fascinating as I can say that. Let's go back to Amber and she will show you some cat crabs. Hello, so I'm here. This is our big sort of rainforest exhibit. I've got some um, little people peeping on us as well, so hopefully you can see these. Um, so in this really big exhibit here, we've got our red devil vampire crabs. We've got about 40 of them in the enclosure so far, and it's a big mixed species exhibit too. So there's also the emerald tree skinks, um, and there'll be some frogs in there shortly too, so it's a real slice of the rainforest. Now, if you guys ever do get to come and have a look for these animals in the exhibit, they can be quite difficult to find. Luckily for you, they are bright red though, so all you need to do is look for a really bright red um, bit in this enclosure and you should spot them but they are really good at hiding. They'll sort of go under the plants and in the water as well. So what I have done to make it a bit easier for you is I've got some out in this little tub. So hopefully you can see them. They're really, really striking animals. They've got these really bright red pincers at the front um, and then they're red on the back too. So hence the name, the red devil vampire crab. They've also got really like bright yellow eyes. So that's where their name comes from too. These are two males in here. So again, if you ever do get to come and have a look here, um, all the animals in this enclosure are males. Now there is a reason for that. Um, we've got lots of off-show enclosures with them too. 
and that's where we keep our females and our breeding groups and our babies of which we've got lots of at the moment um, it's important to keep the babies separate from the adults basically because uh, they're not the best parents and if you leave the babies with the adults the adults even though they're their parents will actually predate on the babies and they might eat them so we have to keep them off show so we can keep the babies really safe while they're growing up until they're grown ups and then they can come into this exhibit now the mums are actually quite good mum crabs they'll keep their babies on their like underneath their tummy basically and they have a little pouch um the eggs start off there and then they hatch out um, and then mums will keep them there for a good few weeks until they're a bit bigger um, and then she'll she'll release them like out into the world when she thinks they're safe enough basically to hopefully stop them getting eaten um, I have got a little replica of one here for you as well I'm not sure how well you'd really be able to see that you'll notice the orangutans really like to have a little nosy as well while we're in here so they've been keeping us occupied during the last few weeks but yeah, this is what they look like. They've also got a little like smiley face on their back, which I think is really cool. Now these crabs are actually um, scavengers as well. So that basically means that they will eat pretty much anything. So they, I've given them a mixture of different sorts of fruits and vegetables today. Um, but they'll eat insects as well. So they're really, really good hunters. Hello. <laughs> um, so sometimes you'll see them scurrying around, catching crickets and stuff in the enclosure too. Um, and that actually means that they're really, really good for the ecosystem too. So they've got an important role to play as scavengers of cleaning things up. So they're found usually around freshwater lakes in Southeast Asia. And basically if something dies, an animal dies, or a bit of like fruit drops onto the floor or something, um, they can help to clean it up. So they're keeping everything nice and tidy. So they're really, really important. Um, that's probably it for now. I hope you've enjoyed our virtual zoo day so far and if you do want to show some more support for us um, there's loads of ways that you can. So you can donate or become one of our members or adopt an animal here at the zoo. Um, you can find out more information on the link on this post. Um, but your support means that we can carry on our vital conservation work here in the zoo during these challenging times so we really appreciate it. But that's it from us for now. Hopefully you've um, found out some of our um, in interesting bugs here. Um, yeah, so hopefully you can stick around and we've got slots at 1pm. Thank you.